In Cincinnati, it's the 100th opening day. A clean slate and big red hopes for general manager Bob Howsam and new field manager Vern Rapp. Former big red machine mate Tony Perez was welcomed back and Dave Parker returned to his hometown to take over in right. A retired Johnny Bench was all smiles because the Reds wasted no time starting the party. Gary Reedus led off against the Mets with a bang. And New York's record-tying streak of nine straight opening day victories was broken as the Reds exploded for seven runs in the first two innings. Concepcion took advantage of a remodeling job at Riverfront Stadium. The outfield wall was lowered from 12 to 8 feet, and that gave Davey his first home run this year. There it goes. The wall also worked for Eddie Milner, who went the other way for a three-run shot that would not have cleared a year ago. swung for the wall again in the sixth, but 83 Rookie of the Year Darryl Strawberry went fence climbing. The straw man also provided New York's only offense. In his first at bat, he blasted a ball that no wall could contain. Soto was oh so fine on the mound. He went the distance and struck out eight as Cincinnati cruised eight to one. San Diego lost 21 games last year that were tied in the seventh inning. So manager Dick Williams addressed the problem by acquiring top reliever Goose Gossage, who could make the difference. There's no moderation in this body at all in anything that I do. And, uh, you know, I try and throw the ball every time that I get it as hard as I can, whether it's a slider or a fastball. And every time that I go out there on that mound, I can say this, that I can look myself in the mirror uh, and say that I tried my best. The teams know now that when they come in to play the Padres that they're going to have to get a lead on us early to, in order to really stay in the ball game. because if it goes down, if we've got a one-run lead in the eighth and ninth, then here comes the goose and he's going to close the door on a lot of teams. Greg Nettles will be at third, and Alan Wiggins was shifted to second, opening left field for the powerful platoon combo of Bobby Brown and rookie Carmelo Martinez. Tony Gwynn moves to right, and 83 minor league player of the year Kevin McReynolds gets the job in center. You have to remember, prior to two years ago, they were uh, the last place club for a number of years. So I think we've made good progress. Jack McKean has done an outstanding job in acquiring players and developing in the farm system. It's just been a tremendous overhaul. We have a championship quality team this year. We've got strength in all areas. Very solid team. We've got a lot of good young players that are going into their third and fourth years, which means they're starting to get the maturity and experience that a championship need, team needs. And we've also got a nice blend of veterans that have been in championship and World Series competition. In the East, Pittsburgh is expected to contend after finishing second last year, and the 84 lineup will display a new image. The long tradition of heavy lumber might slumber, because the Bucks have opted instead to be sound on the mound. John Tudor came from Boston for hitman Mike Eastler. Tudor won 13 for the Red Sox last year and seems well suited for the Pirates staff. I'm impressed with the way he throws. He seems like he has not only a good arm, but he seems like he's got a good mental approach to the game. He, you know, he doesn't get too excited about it. He just goes out, does his job, does a good job at it, and uh, he's very relaxed. And he'll, he'll fit in. He'll be a bucko. Jose De Leon fit in fine last year with seven wins in half a season. And Larry McWilliams won 15, was named top lefty in the league. The improvement and the development of our young pitching staff was the catalyst of everything that transpired. You can't win without pitching. We had the pitching to throw at the opposition, and uh, we went right down to the last three, four games before we were eliminated out of winning it. Center fielder Marvell Wynn is the only remaining starter in a recast outfield that will feature newly acquired 15-year veteran Amos Otis in left. 
He got some good young competitors. Uh, Marvell Wynn, he can go get them. Uh, as Rupert Jones, Oval, uh, myself, they make me feel young again, you know, keeping up with them. So, uh, you know, I would offer advice uh, when it's needed, and uh, I'm not too shy to ask for advice myself. Rookie Doug Probel is advising the Bucks that he can do the job all right in right. I believe in the things I can do out in right field that are going to help the club, and I believe I can do them best. So hopefully as things progress along spring training, the job will be mine. 12-year veteran Lee Lacey will get plenty of outfield work as well. And the Pirates could stand tall this year. We know what kind of team we got. We know what kind of talent we got. And we know what talent around the league. And we know we can compete with anybody in the National League. Now it's time for this week's Volkswagen quiz, brought to you by the 1984 models. It's not a car, it's a Volkswagen. Pittsburgh's Bill Madlock won his fourth batting title last year, and it was the 24th in Pirate history. That's the most of any team in the majors. Dave Parker won two straight titles in 77 and 78, and the great Roberto Clemente won four in the 60s. For this week's quiz, which American League team has had the most batting chance? Stay tuned for near perfect hitters. It only happened. American League gold for the world champion Baltimore Orioles on opening day at Memorial Stadium, where the O's bring in the new season with winged hopes from on high for another flight to the top. Everything was positively cheeky as President Reagan threw out the first pitch. But the mood would soon turn serious because the game was a rematch of last year's league championship series with Chicago. Leadoff hitter Rudy Law got the White Sox going when he opened the game with a base hit. Law was moved to third by another single off Orioles starter Scott McGregor, and that set the stage for Harold Baines to bring Law home with what proved to be the game-winning RBI. McGregor took the loss after surrendering three runs in the first two innings. Manager Joe Altabelli tried to summon a little Oriole magic, but Chicago's defense was not falling for any slide of back. Cy Young winner Lamar Hoyt picked right up where he left off in 83, going seven and a third innings for his 15th straight win. Hoyt's performance had Chicago soaring because he was 0-4 with an 8.06 ERA in spring training. Harold Baines put the icing on Chicago's victory cake with two more RBIs in the sixth inning. passed the first test in his conversion from starter to reliever, closing out the O's to gain the save and give the Sox some sweet revenge with a 5-2 win. On to opening day at the Big A in Anaheim, California, where Ralph Houck's Boston Red Sox ran into an angel force named Ken Forsh, a complete game six hitter for Forsh, who struck out eight along the way, and he didn't walk anybody. Boston's Bruce Hurst was also hot, hurling a shutout into the ninth inning. And Hurst helped out on defense as well. But the Angel defense was also dynamite. With the game still scoreless in the eighth, Rick Miller pinch hit with a man on. The Angels tried to move into position to handle Miller, but they didn't move fast enough. Boston took a one nothing lead on career hit number 1,000 for Miller. 
But Angel fans were still hopeful in the bottom of the ninth when Bob Boone stepped up with two out and the bases loaded. Rookie Jack Gutierrez aired on his throw, and the Angels celebrated a dramatic two-to-one victory. Down in Texas, the Rangers figured to catch up to the top of the West. Manager Doug Rader added a booming bat to the Ranger attack with the acquisition of former twin Gary Ward. It's going to be a little tough to pitch around hitters in our lineup like they were doing to me last year in Minnesota. So it's going to be a big difference uh, as far as power and run score goes for the Texas Rangers. Switch hitting rookie Curtis Wilkerson takes over at shortstop in Raiders Ranger scheme. We're very, very diligent in the things that we're trying to accomplish, and we're, we're very confident in our abilities, and we did not lose too many ball games last year. We got beat a few, but we did not lose any too many ball games. And I think that kind of a positive feeling is rubbing off, and I think that everybody here is is uh, on the program, and they think that good things are ahead for us. Ned Yost was brought in from Milwaukee to catch the top pitching core in the league last year. Yost will juggle the hard heat of Dave Stewart with the soft finesse of staff ace Charlie Huff, whose knuckleball baffles the best of them. All you try to do is push the ball out so that the ball doesn't have a rotation, no spin on the ball. And I do it with these two first two fingernails. My thumb and fingers are on the side of the ball so I can let it go and just push it straight out. And ideally, I'd let the ball go and it would stay just like this all the way to the plate and the wind resistance would make it bounce around a little bit. Having Charlie pitch the night before me is like having the lights on in one minute and then turning the lights off. It makes it hard for your eyes to adjust. The pitching is set, so if the hitting is there, the Rangers could roll. Last year we lost 52 ball games by two or fewer runs, and that just shows that uh, the, what we need to make up for is a little bit of offense. We led the, led the league in ERA and in defense. If we can score some more runs, we can be in first place later than the All-Star break. In the East, Toronto is showing all the signs of a division contender after a strong challenge through much of last season. The shadow of doubt that fell on the Blue Jay bullpen in 83 should vanish because right-hander Dennis Lamp was acquired from the White Sox and left-hander Brian Clark came over from Seattle. Our bullpen with our new acquisitions, Brian Clark and uh, Dennis Lamp, uh, I think has strengthened our pitching staff quite a bit. I like both of them, and they're both going to mix well and fit well with uh, the makeup of our, our ten, 10 pitchers. The Jays should kick up a storm on offense as well. The coaching staff put no pressure on youngsters like Willie Upshaw and showed patience with others like Lloyd Mosby. That plan is paying big dividends. I think Pat Gillick hanging with the younger ball players uh, throughout thick and thin have, have definitely paid off. Uh, again, I hit 239, 235, and, and they called me in the office and said, hey, uh, you're going to be my center fielder. So I think patience was the key. My first year hit 230 minor leagues and uh, rookie leagues. Second year single A hit 210. But they stuck with me. They showed a lot of patience. And I guess they knew that I was going to come around aggressively hitting them. Off. Well, Jesse uh, per at bat last year had the best home run uh, ratio, and uh, I'm looking for big numbers from him, but not putting any pressure on him. If he hit 15 and hit 300 and drove in 90, that'd be fine with me, but I think someday Jesse's very capable of hitting 40 home runs and possibly leading the league in RBIs. The Blue Jays could make a good run if they can put up the numbers because the team is well stocked with talent. We have a problem of too many good players. As in the past, we, we could pick 25 men and just put them in our pocket and go home. But now we've got, I think, 35 to 40 good men, and uh, it's going to be a tough job for Bobby Cox. I'm glad I'm not the manager. Well, now let's manage the answer to this week's Volkswagen quiz. The Detroit Tigers lead the American League with 22 batting champions. Norm Cash was the last winner with the 361 average in 1961. Two years earlier, Harvey Keene won it by hitting 353 in 59, and Al Kaline 340 in 1955. Harry Heilman won four, and between 1907 and 1919, Detroit's Hall of Famer Ty Cobb won a record 12 championships. Now you owe me four. Take a fish. Television and baseball make a mighty pretty picture. Major leaguers appear on TV all season long. 
but they also watch their share. And just like anybody else, they sometimes fantasize about playing a character in a series or in the movies. So gentlemen, tell us, who would you like to be? You really want to know, huh? Well, I'm going to tell you this. I think I'd like to be Johnny Olsen on The Price is Right, because I've always wanted to say, come on down, Beaver Cleaver. If I could be on Leave it to Beaver and have a chance to get back at Wally for all those innuendos he threw at Beaver all, all the years, I'd jump at that chance. <laughs> I'd just like to appear on Dynasty one time so I could slap Joan Collins. I think I'd like to be someone like Rin Tin Tin. I mean, what other dog besides Lassie gets his own uh, TV show? I mean, that's, that's classic, Rin Tin Tin. I'd like to be Magnum. He gets all the girls, he's in Hawaii, he's driving around a Ferrari. Seems to have a lot of fun, that'd be great. If I could cut my hair like uh, Mr. T and uh, put on all the, the gold necklaces and the rings and the, you know, the bracelets, I feel that I can do just as good a job as he can. I'd like to be Richard Dawson of Family Food. <laughs> See, I think it's just great when you can go around and kiss any young lady and not be, be rejected. See, I get rejected a lot when I try to kiss a woman. I like Clint Eastwood's role, personally. Uh, Make My Day is one of the greatest lines I've ever heard. Make My Game. I like to be somebody like Lauren Green, because I know when I die, I'm going to come back again. When I come back, I'm going to be the head of a, a spaceship. I'm going to be the captain of the main hot show. I think I would enjoy being Mel Allen, uh, who does the, who's the voice for this week in baseball, because uh, uh, day in and day out, he has uh, every, what, every Saturday or so on the highlights, uh, the voice itself is uh, something of a, a Hall of Fame type of voice, and the cruiser is in that, uh, in, in that company. That's a way to tell it like it is. Seriously, fans, baseball gloves have come a long way from the malformed, misshaped models of the game's earliest days. The modern mitt is made with far more care and precision. And although some players like Joe Morgan still use small gloves, most use a much larger version. <laughs> well, not that large. But either way, a player's choice of glove is indeed a personal matter. Well, I had this one uh, 12 years. Uh, you see, it got a lot of holes in it. Just in case the ball comes through the middle of it, I catch it in my bare hand. But I've only had two gloves in the major league since I've been in baseball. Cardinal Ozzie Smith is called the whiz for his glove work at short. Basically what it is is a old Stan Musial type of trapeze. Uh, they call it a six finger and simply because of the, the webbing in here, which uh, I guess is a little bit different from the, the gloves that they make today with the basket web and, and all of that. And uh, it's like I tell anybody that, that come to me and ask me about a glove. It's comfort. I used it when I was young, and I've always felt real comfortable with it, and um, they had discontinued the use of it when I got here, and uh, I told them what type of glove I, I wanted. Uh, I sent one in that was ripped up, and they couldn't sew it back, so they started making it again for me. I like to keep a medium-sized glove. I don't like the ball too big, because it seems to be too hard to get it out of the glove once you get it in there, uh, and you have a better feel for the ball. Uh, I like to get them stiff to start off with, because that way you can really shape them the way you want to. Uh, it seems like if you get a glove that's broken in right away, it wears out too fast and it gets too flexible and it seems like the balls pop out a little more. The small catcher's met of pirate Tony Pena helps him shoot down runners with a fast grip on the ball. It's a really small glove. This is the small glove they make. Um, see, my glove, I, I have to hold right here. This is where I catch that ball all the time. Okay. You know, I, like I, it, I never catch the ball here, well, here, and here. Together. I always kind of come right through to my hole over there. Well, this way well, I can you. get the ball quick and throw anybody out. You know, I worked real hard to get it like this. Matter of fact, I didn't even like it when it was new. It wasn't until it got real old and ugly like this that it really started to feel real comfortable. It's real loose, and most players like their glove a lot stiffer than this, and some players run through two gloves a year. This is all, basically the only glove I've ever had, so. You know, this is it. When I was a kid, I didn't have the one glove. And since I've been an adult, the major leagues have only had one glove. You're a man in love with this glove. Time now for the Big Stick Player of the Week Award. Brought to you by new improved Old Spice Stick Deodorant and Andy Perspirant. This week's winner is Cincinnati's Dave Parker. In his first game as a Red on opening day in the Queen City against the Mets, Parker went two for four with two runs batted in, and he also scored a run. On 
Parker's first at bat in his hometown, he delivered a single with the bases loaded for the game-winning RBI. So welcome home, Dave. Accept our ray. And congratulations. That's all for now, folks. See you next week on This Week in Baseball. Thank mm -hmm. you.